it's a pleasure to have Professor Tanu Padmanabhan, uh, Dean and Distinguished Professor of IUCA Pune, to deliver the uh, Infosys Science Foundation lecture in association with Institute of Science Education Research Trivandrum and Institute of Science of uh, Space Science and Technology Trivandrum. The Infosys Science Foundation lectures are a series of public talks organized to popularize science and research and to inspire and motivate young minds to pursue science as a career. These talks are given by jurors and laureates of the Infosys Prize. Professor Padmanabhan is the winner of the inaugural Infosys Science um, uh, Prize in Physical Sciences in 2009. Professor Padmanabhan obtained his bachelor's and master's in physics in Kerala University and obtained his PhD from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in 1983. Since 1992, he has been in Ayuka as a dean, which he is holding still. His research interests are gravitation, cosmology, and quantum theory. In the recent years, his work has led to clear interpretation of gravity as an emergent phenomena. This approach, which has far-reaching implications for quantum gravity and provides a possible way to understand the nature of dark energy, which is what he is going to talk to us in the next one hour or so. And for this, he has won several prizes, six times in the recent years from the Gravity, Gravity Research Foundation USA. Padranaran has authored nine advanced level textbooks, acclaimed as magnificent achievements and used worldwide as standard references. Padranaran is currently the chairman of the Astrophysics Commission of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. He was the president of the Cosmological Union, Cos Commission of the uh, Inter International Astronomical Union between 2009 to 2012, and a Sackler Distinguished Astronomer of the Institute of Astronomy, Cambridge. He is an elected fellow of all the three uh, academies of sciences in India, as well as the Third World Academy of Sciences. He has received numerous national and international awards, including the TWA Prize in Physics, the inaugural Infosys Prize, as I mentioned earlier, the Al Khwazir uh, International Award from uh, the Government of Iran, the Miguna Award from the University of Melbourne, the Millennium Medal, and the Shanti Swarup Badnaga Prize. In recognition of his achievements, the President of India awarded him the Padma Shri in 2007. So, uh, so we all know Paddy comes from rice after removal of husk. In the next one hour or so, Paddy, as uh, Padma is often referred in the scientific circle, will remove the shaft by taking through the history of cosmos and introduce us to its mysteries to ponder. With this, I welcome Professor Padmanabhan to deliver this. Thank you, Shanky, for your kind words. And uh, I would also formally like to thank Infosys Science Foundation, which made this visit and this lecture possible. They have this series of lectures, as Shanky mentioned, and uh, I've been giving similar talks at uh, Bangalore earlier. And I said I want to do one in Trivandrum, and they arranged it with the auspicious of uh, ICER and ISAT. Uh, Shanky mentioned. So today I want to describe to you some exciting results, new results in the field of cosmology. And since most of the audience is not cosmologists, I would like to start with a reassuring note that the cosmology as we look at it today is an extremely simple subject. There's nothing to worry about. In particular, what this guy out here is doing is one of the two things. He is either trying to look at the structure of physical laws and from that obtain something about the structure of the universe, which is shown here in an arrow here. So you want to explain the structure of the cosmos from known physical laws. And we have been remarkably successful in doing that. We now understand the universe from something like a fraction of a billion of a second to a period of about 14 billion years. We actually understand it, and we can compare it with observations, and the theory matches with observations. This is a fantastic achievement, and it's a very satisfying achievement by any standard. But actually, the real fun is not in this. It's fine, it's good. But the real fun is in the other way around. The question to ask is, what happened before this 1 billion observation? What we understand is almost always is uninteresting compared to what we don't understand. And this is something which we still don't completely understand. And this gives us a unique opportunity of doing it in reverse. Use the structure of the universe and what we know observationally about the nature of the universe to test physical theory. You come up with different models for physical interactions at very high energies. 
which you cannot test in your laboratory because of your technological limitations. And you ask what its consequences will be for the structure of the universe and compare it with cosmological observation. So you use universe as a very large physical laboratory and in fact nothing can be larger than that by definition. Use it to understand the structure of physical law. So I want to spend some time describing this part, the known, and then move over to the unknown and explain to you some recent results which actually throws light on the physical laws at very high energy. Okay, this is going to be the plan of the talk. So let us start with the structure of physical laws as we understand it today and how do we codify them. Okay. So one way to introduce this which I have often found is very nice and uh, of least complicated method is to think in terms of some fundamental constants which we know of in physics. There is one constant which I have marked as G which is the Newtonian gravitational constant which measures the attraction between different bodies due to gravity and this is the Newton's gravitational constant. Then there is another constant here H or H cross which is called the Planck's constant which tells you all about quantum mechanics and how quantum theory interfaces with rest. And here is a constant C which comes from relativity. So here is relativity, quantum theory and gravity. Now what one wants to look at is to look at different aspects and different sides and corners of this cube which I call the cube, cube of theoretical physics. First if you start from the origin and move along the direction of gravity that is you do not switch this on, you do not switch this on, you only have gravity. Then you get what is known as Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian gravitational mechanics. And that is very powerful. It rules over the macro world and it tells you everything about for example planetary motion or structure of galaxies or how even galaxies move in the universe etc. etc. Quite a lot of things can be obtained just by this action. Okay, let us switch and go in this direction. And in this direction you end up getting what is known as the special theory of relativity which was started by Einstein in 2000, uh, in uh, 1905 and we celebrated its centenary just a few years back in 2005. So the special theory of relativity changes the Newtonian concepts in many drastic ways. There is one thing everybody knows, E equals mc square, that is energy and mass are one and the same and are interconvertible. There is another one which is not so well known is that Einstein's special theory of relativity told you that the space and time are very deeply interwoven with each other. We normally think of time as measured by clocks and we would have thought that whether we are walking or whether we are standing still the clock will run at the same rate and what Einstein showed and experiments verified is that this is not true. If you are moving the clocks run slower compared to when you are stationary. So time is a relative concept just like space and the space and time gets interwoven into an idea called space time, a mathematical construct called space time. Now if you go instead of this direction and this direction we have tried, if you go in this direction you end up getting what is known as quantum mechanics. Just as gravity rules over the macro world, quantum mechanics governs everything which is happening in the microscopic world. For example, all of chemistry comes from quantum mechanics so to speak. The physics of molecules, physics of atoms, subatomic particles, all the require the laws of quantum mechanics and they do not, uh, the classical mechanics which we know of which govern motion of let us say cars or pulleys or balls etc. is an approximation to quantum mechanics. The quantum mechanics is a more exact theory. It also changes one fundamental concept which we have all adhered to in classical world and that is usually called the uncertainty principle. If I throw a tennis ball up in the air, you can measure its speed and its position at any given time. This is what we would have thought. I know where it is and how fast it is going. Quantum mechanics tells you that you cannot do this. If you measure the position and the speed, both of them has to be in, uh, inaccurate or inexact by a small amount and you cannot reduce the inaccuracy in one of them all the way down to zero without paying a price of infinite inaccuracy in the other one. So if you know the position exactly, you do not know what the speed is and vice versa. 
So we have by now introduced any one of these things. Here I introduce quantum mechanics, but I don't keep relativity and gravity. Or I go along relativity, don't keep these two things. But what if we, we switch on two of them? Suppose we want special theory of relativity, you bring in the principles of relativity, and you also want to describe gravity. So you go in this direction as well as in this direction. When you reach something called general theory of relativity, whose centenary we are going to celebrate next year? This was, this came from Einstein in 1915, 2015 is its centenary. General theory of relativity again changes our concept of how you view gravity. And it introduces gravity as a curvature in space time. Special relativity introduces the concept of space time and the general relativity makes it a curved space time. What does that mean? Roughly speaking, here is a fabric on which you have a heavy ball. So just as this heavy ball curves the fabric, the existence of something like sun will curve the space time around it. Imagine this to caricature of the space time. And if I keep another ball here and it rolls down, if I didn't know there is an underlying fabric which is curved, you might think that there is a force of attraction between the two. This is how gravity is interpreted as due to curvature of space. Einstein also told us one more thing, and that I have written here. It actually happens to be an exact equation. What it, but very simple, but exact equation. What it tells you is that the amount of curvature here, how do you measure that? In order to see how curved it is, you just draw a circle like this. The radius of that circle will tell you how curved it is. If I take a rod, that is right. If I bend it slightly, it is like an arc of a very large radius circle. So it is not curved very much. If I bend it a lot more, then the radius becomes smaller and it is curved more. So the radius by which it is turning is an inverse measure of the curvature. So what it told you is that if I take that radius, square it and uh, take one by that, that is related to the amount of energy which is present here. So if you put lot of energy, you are putting lot of mass because of E equals mc square. And if you put lot of mass, there is lot of gravity and that is equivalent to lot of curvature. The importance of this for us is that general relativity also tells you that the universe is expanding. And the universe doubles its size roughly at a time scale which is of the order of this radius divided by speed of light. So when the universe was say one second old, it was doubling its size every second very rapidly. And when the universe is now 14 billion years old, it is old and it is tired and it doubles its size only once in 14 billion years. So its doubling rate has come down. Okay? So this formula explains to you how these two are related. Now, if instead of going like this, if I go like this, I am putting together quantum mechanics and special theory of relativity. That also leads to something very drastic. It is called quantum field theory. What does quantum field theory tells you? For our purpose, the most important concept which comes in quantum field theory is that the idea of vacuum is very different from what we are accustomed to. By we normally think of vacuum as nothing, nothing is happening there. But it turns out that in quantum field theory, vacuum is a very interesting place. And this is an artist caricature of the vacuum fluctuation. In the sense that the place which we think is empty is a constant milling ground for particles and antiparticles being produced and annihilated constantly. There is fluctuations in energy and other attributes and it is not uh, empty nothingness as we think of. So this is probably the most important idea which comes from quantum field theory. It also, as I told you, introduces this notion of antiparticles. We all have heard that atoms are made of protons, neutrons and electrons. To take the electron, there is an antiparticle to an electron called positron. It might sound very mysterious, but this is something which, uh, if you are not very lucky, you may have to go through a scan one of these days called PET scan, PET scan in any hospital. And that P for the PET stands for positron. So this highly exotic theoretical object is being used in medical diagnostic of tumors. So these positrons are things which you can produce in a good hospital. So it is not esoteric at all. So these are the antiparticles of electrons. And there are antiparticles to every particle which we know of. And that is a result from quantum theory. So I have done all the two-step processes as well. Now the what remains is to switch all of them on. 
We want quantum theory, we want relativity, and we want gravity. Unfortunately, I don't have a photograph to put here because this idea has not existed. So this is the domain of what you call quantum gravity. And this is, in some sense, the unknown final frontier today. But for the purpose of this talk, what I want to stress is that this is needed in cosmology. I told you that the real fun thing is not to worry about what happened after 1 billionth of the second for 14 billion years, even though we will spend a fair amount of time in this talk about that. We want to know what happened before that, and then we want to know what happened before that. So we want to go to the earlier stages of the universe. In order to do that, we want to bring quantum theory which operates at very small scale because the universe was very small and gravity which is very large when everything is condensed to a small particle. So you want to bring quantum theory and gravity together and this is what is needed in cosmology. So we will see evidence for that as we go along. It has a kind of interesting complementarity between the two. Not only that it is needed in cosmology, if you throw in a model for quantum gravity, it tells you whether there are relics in cosmology using which this theory can be tested. So it goes both ways. One is that you need quantum gravity to understand cosmology, but if you think you understand cos uh, quantum gravity, you should be able to apply it to cosmology and test whether your idea is correct. And that also we will do as we go. So this is roughly where we stand today. And now I want to go into the known part of the universe and what we have put together in the last several decades about the structure of the universe. So when you talk about the structure of the universe, the first thing everybody thinks of is the sun and the planetary system. Okay, after all, like charity, various other things begins at home, so we might as well have cosmology beginning at home. So you have sun here and there is a tiny planetary system around it. And if you look around it, uh, some of you might even recognize a few stars. This is Proxima and Alpha Centauri, which is very close to the Sun. And this is Sirius, the brightest star in the heavens. And the distance scale here is like 10 light years. So I go a bit further. So now the distance scale is 1000 light years. And you can still recognize a few stars. Betelgeuse, which is the Arudra, then Rigel, this is in the Orion Nebula. And Sun is somewhere out here. And now it is 1000 light years. But in order to see the real dramatic effect of what is going on in our neighborhood, you have to go to this kind of a time, a length scale. This is 10,000 light years is this length, so it is much bigger than that. Here you see the vast expanse of our own galaxy. So, sun is somewhere out here, it is not at the center of the galaxy. And there are these spiral arms, these beautiful spiral arms, each having a name. These spiral arms, or the regions where there is intense amount of stellar activity going on and there is relatively less in the gas. So this is the structure of our galaxy and if you go still further, here is our Milky Way galaxy as a tiny dot and the nearest large galaxy is an Andromeda galaxy which is out here and there are all these galaxies which are all formed together, gravitationally bound and this forms what is known as a local group of galaxies. So here is a, until then it was an artist's impression, this is a real photograph of the Andromeda galaxy out here. It is a very large galaxy, the nearest large galaxy to Milky Way galaxy. And we have seen a zoo of galaxies, I mean we have billions of galaxies, they come in all sizes, shapes, structures and we do understand most of them. And um, this is just a sample of galaxies which you can pick up anytime you go to internet. But it is interesting to ask how these galaxies are distributed in the universe. They are not distributed like atoms in a solid, like a regular array, like a cubic lattice. They are also not distributed at the other extreme, completely randomly. You just throw them totally randomly. It is distributed with some pattern. So these are all galaxies forming large clusters. So you can see these filamentary kind of structures and large empty regions. So there are filaments and voids in the universe as defined by the location of these galaxies. And in fact it is very beautiful. If only we had the eye to see the galaxies, if you could detect galaxies with naked eye and if you can just disregard all the stars in the... People think, especially poets, that the starry heavens is very beautiful. That is because they haven't seen galaxies. If you see galaxies, this is how sky will look. This is just, this is real picture. This is not uh, artist uh, impression. This is taken from real photographs and put together as a mosaic. Colors are real. 
these are colors are uh, red galaxies and blue galaxies if you like a more realistic distance oriented uh, impression it is here these colors are false colors so you take a point here and if you go along this red line you are going further and further away or here also you are going further and further away this direction is some angular direction in the sky and there is a third direction which is sort of skews like a slice of a slice of a pizza so you again see that there are regions where densities are very high there are regions where densities are low and there is these filaments and there are these structures so this is how the heavens are made of and that brings you to two important questions the first question is okay there is all these galaxies you talk in numbers like billions how much matter is actually there in the universe if i take all the galaxies and distribute them uniformly what is the density what it is that is the way we would measure the density of an iron rod we know that it is made of uh, atoms and in between it is empty space but you can calculate what is the density mean density of the iron rod so in the same way what is the mean density of the universe how much is that second more important how did all these structures form where did all these galaxies come from can we understand that using our laws of physics so let me start with the first one the way you measure the total amount of matter in cosmology is in terms of a very convenient number which is the last letter of greek alphabet it is called omega which roughly measures the strength of gravity to the rate at which the universe is expanding all that you need to remember is that if omega is greater than 1 then the universe will expand to a maximum size and will then collapse back if omega is less than 1 it will continue to expand forever omega equals 1 is the critical border line and there also it expands forever now omega equals 1 is a special universe and many theoreticians believe that is very very beautiful universe i agree with them but ultimately you have to measure what is the omega for the universe which can be determined by observation so people did this this game has been going on for 3 4 decades so first thing to do is to take all the visible galaxies add up their masses measure their masses add them up and then divide by the volume and get the density when you do that you get a number which is very tiny you typically get 5% instead of 1 you get 0.5 0.05 so you get about 5% of the amount of matter you need to make the universe recollapse and of course then the universe will expand forever and it is nowhere near unity however there is a catch this observation is based on all the matter which is emitting light so you can ask or is there matter in the universe which is not emitting light there could very well be and in fact observations tell you that there is a lot more matter in the universe which is not emitting light than the ones which is emitting light how do we know that let me give you a couple of uh, ways of measuring so here is a visible galaxy you can measure all the visible mass out there conveniently for us it is think of it like sun sun is very visible and it is emitting light and you can measure its mass but you have planets going around the sun and by measuring the speed with which a planet is going around the sun you can again estimate the mass of the sun just like that there are tiny hydrogen clouds which are not emitting light but the tiny hydrogen clouds are going around this and you can measure their speed from the radio emission from that and using that you can estimate the mass now if the galaxy is entirely made of this visible matter which we see here then the speed with which these hydrogen clouds should be going around it should follow this this curve what we observe is this so the difference between these two tell you that there is lot more matter here than which is emitting light and this is called the dark matter and these are called the rotation curves of the galaxy another way of measuring this effect of dark matter is shown here so if you look at this picture you can see all these arc like structures very beautiful there are these things and there is some giant arc here and then arc here etc what are these arcs due to these arcs are actually normal honest to god elliptically shaped galaxies but these galaxies are far away behind and then there is in between there is a very large galaxy cluster which is coming in our line of sight from that distant galaxies and that and the light from the distant galaxies as it passes through this cluster of galaxies get distorted because in einstein's theory light bends when it goes near a massive body 
and your dimorphic body acts like a lens and it also distorts the image. So what you see here is the distortion of nine galaxies into the arc-like shape due to intervening gravitating matter. By measuring the amount of distortion, you can measure how much matter is there. And you can measure all the matter which is there, whether it is emitting light or not. So this is another way of measuring dark matter. And all these measurements together consistently tells you that the dark matter contributes about 25%. So the normal matter you and I are made of is like 5%, this is about 25%, we are getting there but only still 30% and while the theoretical number was 1. Okay? So just keep that in mind. So the current picture of the universe, if this is all there is in the universe, would be you have this normal matter, its density will drop as the universe expands. I mean, you have some amount of matter and you expand the volume, its density will drop by some law. The dark matter is some five times more or so eight times more than this normal matter. And it has higher density at any given time and it, that density will also drop. Down. There is one more component in the universe which plays a very important role in what we see. This is the radiation. Our entire universe behaves as though it is kept in a box, a microwave oven. And the oven's temperature is set by somebody to 2.73 Kelvin. Okay. So you are filled with radiation in all directions, which has a very thermal characteristic and it is uniform like this and it is 2.7 Kelvin. And in fact, if you have a bad TV, the old fashioned TV with not much of a noise regulator with two aerials, then you can actually observe the Big Bang. One percent of the ice you see in the TV when you tune between two places is actually because of it is sensitive to the microwave background radiation coming from the earliest epoch of the Big Bang when it was universe was 10,000 times smaller than the current size. So this is something which one can measure and that radiation falls steeper, faster than the normal matter because of uh, its different properties. So this is how the density of the radiation drops, the blue drops. Which means that the total density in the universe will follow like this and there is one particular epoch at which the, and the density contributed by the radiation and density contributed by the matter will be equal. So at that time you can measure what this density is. It is denoted by the Greek letter rho and you say rho at equality. This is a pure number. Now, I want to drive the cosmology talk into a direction of three numbers. There are three densities in the universe. If you tell me them, I can build a universe for you. And everything about the universe is contained in these three numbers. So the theoretician's job is to understand these three numbers. So this is first of the three numbers. And we believe that high energy physics can tell us what this number is because it can tell you how much radiation is there and how much dark matter is there, eventually. Okay. So you can find this number. Now let me address the second question which I told you about, namely how did all these structures come into being? That is very important because that is the question man has been asking for years. So it's a very easy way nowadays. If you want to know how universe got formed, let us make a universe. Here it is. You start with the early days when there is small perturbations in the energy density and you run a computer simulation just putting the known laws of physics and you end up, as time goes on, which is indicated by the number here, you will end up forming the kind of structures which you saw before. I showed you the observed distribution of galaxies and uh, I'm sure you'll agree that it looks something like that. So you start with the tiny, tiny little bit of density enhancements in one place compared to the other and then the rich gets richer and the poor gets poorer and you get these galaxies and things like that condensing out of. So this is something which you can actually do. You can actually do that if you have a good computer at your hand and you know how to write a code. But is it really true? Is it the way the structures got uh, formed in the universe? Can I test this observationally? Is there a direct test of this theory? Indeed there is. And in order to see how it is possible, how it is possible directly, you have to understand that the cosmologists are very lucky. They can actually see into the past. When I am looking at you, I am seeing you not as you are right now, but a fraction of a second earlier. Because light takes that much of time to come from you to me. When I look at sun, I see it as it was 8 minutes earlier. So if I look very far deep into 
uses is space. I am looking at the universe as it was much earlier on. I can actually see the photograph of the universe when it was thousand times smaller. I don't have to theorize, I don't have to speculate, I can actually see it. And then I can compare it with what I did in the computer simulation and try to understand whether this is true. So how do you see that? I told you that there is this radiation at 2.7 Kelvin, but actually it is not so smooth. There are regions where the densities are, the radiation temperature is higher, there are regions where the temperature, uh, temperature is lower. This difference here is very tiny, it's few parts in a million. But technology has told us how to do this. And this is a real gold mine of experimental information which we have today. Now it is so important that people spend an enormous amount of time, money and effort on that. And this is really fascinating. This is what technology can do to us in understanding a purely theoretical subject. This is what our understanding of this radiation was in 1992. This is about 10 years later. This is another 10 years later. You can see the dramatic improvement. We now have this high risk. What you are seeing here is the universe when it was 1000 times smaller. It's a photograph of the real universe when it was 1000 times smaller. We could get it only at this resolution, then at this resolution, then at this resolution, and it is improved. So this can be translated into mathematics. This lecture is a public lecture, so I don't want you to worry about what this graph is, but I just want to highlight something. This translates mathematically what you saw here in picture, where there is lot of temperature and where there is less temperature. What you need to understand is the following. Observationally, you have these red points here. These points come from observation. Then you see a blue or a greenish line going through that. That comes from theory. And you can see this remarkable agreement between observations and theory, which tells you that our theoretical ideas about the universe are right on dot, right on several dots, in fact. Okay. So, how this theory. I am going to describe to you what that theory is in a moment, most of the rest of the talk will have more on this, it is directly verified by observation as the universe was. This brings you to two questions related to this. It is very good for me to tell you that when thousand times smaller the universe had small density fluctuation, it grew and became galaxies. But then how did those these fluctuations got there when the universe was thousand times smaller? What happened before that? Where did these come from? That is one question. Second question is, if I put these fluctuations in, do I actually get the structure which is? So let us address these two. We know the answers to both of these. The first answer where this came from has to do with the old friend which I introduced for you. The vacuum fluctuations in the universe, where we thought there was nothing, and these fluctuations in the energy in the very early universe, grew due to gravitational effects and form structures like this. And then, if you put these structures into your computer and you drive the universe forward, you do see the kind of galaxies which we have. So I want to spend some time describing to you both of these. So let me first do this part. So here is the vacuum fluctuations leading to these, uh, these uh, fluctuations you see in the sky. But if you want this to work, this idea works and leads to what you see only if there is what is known as an inflationary phase in the very early universe. So I want to describe that to you. I told you that there is the radiation energy density which goes like this and there is the dark matter energy density which goes like this. So if you go into the past, these two things will keep increasing, so we thought. But what the inflation tells you or what the observations which I showed you, this tells you, is that there is a time when this has to turn around and the universe should have had a constant density even at this stage. A constant density means constant curvature. Constant curvature means constant doubling of time, which means that the universe is expanding very rapidly. But think of your national savings certificate, which used to double, let us say, every eight year or something. And if you leave it alone every eight year, it will keep doubling, which is a very rapid growth. So the universe was expanding very rapidly whenever densities are constant. If densities are dropping, it does not expand that rapidly. 
what this observation tell you is that you had a face like this in the early universe. And that can produce one more density for you. I first told you that there is a density, a number, pure number, which, which tells you where these are. Now you need one more density, which is a constant density at the inflationary phase. Okay? Now, we believe that the high energy physics, high energy particle physics and interaction of high energy particles will eventually tell us both these numbers. We don't know them very precisely, but there are several models, but there is nothing in principle which tells us we can't calculate them. So in principle, these two numbers are calculable, so there is nothing mysterious about them. Okay, now let me come to the really mysterious part of the universe. You would have thought it happened very early on. No, it is happening right now. So you start with this and you try to get these structures, like the galaxies. This depends on the composition of the universe. If you tinker with the composition of the universe, you start from the same thing and you will end up with very different universes today, so it won't match with observation. What it tells you is that the universe should have a very weird composition. It should have about 5% of normal matter. It should have about 25% of dark matter. This we have already seen. The remaining about 70% should be contributed by something called cosmological constant. I will explain in greater detail what a cosmological constant is. But roughly speaking, it is a term you add in Einstein's theory. Okay? You tinker with Einstein's equations and add a term there. This is what used to be called, and some of you might uh, read in popular literature, as something called dark energy. Okay? But whenever I talk about dark energy, people get confused. They start thinking of dark weather and star wars and things of that sort. So I thought I will demystify it. It is just a term which you add into Einstein's equation. And that is consistent with all the observations which we have. So it is just an algebraic term. Now, what? how do I know that? See, I told you that this is the composition I want and I want a cosmological constant. there. So can I test this? Is it pure speculation or is there a test? So everything in cosmology today is observational oriented, even uh, very esoteric theoretical part. You can test this because this cosmological constant is constant, which means the density it provides is constant. And I just now told you that if density is constant, universe will expand with acceleration. It will expand very rapidly, just like your money grows in national savings certificate. So the growth which is generated by that is accelerated growth, and we want to measure whether the universe is really accelerating or not. This we can, because I already explained to you that if you go deeper and deeper into the space, you are looking at the universe earlier and earlier. So just go and look at some object one billion years older and ask whether at that time the universe was expanding with a rate bigger than the current rate, lesser than the current rate. Then you know whether the universe is accelerating, whether its speed of expansion is increasing or decreasing. It's as simple as that. Well, is actually not as simple as that. The problem is, when you go deeper and deeper into the phase, you are looking at objects further and further away, and the light from that gets dimmer and dimmer. So in order to catch them, you need bigger and bigger instruments. So this is again a technological challenge. And it's very beautiful how technology comes hand in hand with theory in cosmology. We couldn't do it before, but Hubble Space Telescope first did the breaking of the barrier. Because once you put the telescope up in space, it opens up new vistas and it can see deeper. Nature has also been very kind to us. So there are very massive stars which at the very late stage will explode as something called supernova. These are most powerful uh, explosions you can see in the sky. And in fact, this particular picture is that of something called Crab Nebula in the sky. Which, will, which went boom in 1054 AD. And it was recorded by Chinese astronomers. It was also recorded by some of the Red Indian tribes in Central America. 1054 AD is the height of Chola Empire in South India. This is the golden age of civilization. Nobody has noticed it in South India. But of course, it happened on 4th of July and went on for next two months. Maybe they had very heavy monsoon at that time. But still, it is very, very surprising, and someone should look into it. Some of my colleagues have looked into it, but they found nothing. So, uh, in 1054, this was visible during daytime for two months, some 8 to 10 times brighter than the Venus, 
and uh, it was visible to naked eye for a period of really, depending on your eyesight, really a year to year and a half. So you have such supernova and now, I mean this of course went off in our own galaxy, that is why we could see that. Now we have such supernova going off all over the universe in very distant galaxies, very far away and we can detect it. And using that, we can figure out how the universe, the speed with which the universe was expanding as the size of the universe was increasing, how it was changing. So you can see that the speed, these are all from observation, direct observation. I mean other people's observations, but the, the way it was modeled was done by me and a colleague of mine. So what it tells you very clearly is that the speed of expansion is increasing here. If the speed of the car is increasing, you are accelerating the car. So the universe is accelerating. It is stepping up gas here. It was decelerating nicely and then at some stage it started accelerating. So this is what observations tell you. You can convert these observations into how the density is changing. The density was nicely decreasing but it is reaching a plateau. And this plateau is what I call the cosmological constant give or take some constant factor. So there is a constant energy density in the universe which is maintaining this plateau. The question is, what is this object? So this is, I, I have already told you that this is something which is called cosmological constant. What exactly is it? Mathematically it is very simple. It is a term which you add into Einstein's equation which acts effectively like matter with negative pressure. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine a balloon. Balloon is filled with gas. And if the balloon, if the gas makes the balloon expand, in order to expand it, it has to do work. That work has to come from its energy. So as the balloon expands, it will cool down. Its energy will come down. But if the balloon is filled with a gas which has negative pressure, then it can still expand the balloon and still maintain its own energy. The energy need not come down because it has negative pressure with compensation. That is what the cosmological constant does. So it does not change, it is there and it is uh, driving every other expansion of, of the universe. And that uh, in some sense it is like a sleeper agent. It had a, exactly the same behavior all along. All other energy density just dropped down and when it dropped down it started dominating and it is driving the expansion. Virtually every theoretical physicist believes that this is probably the most important puzzle in uh, theoretical physics. So let me explain to you why. I told you that this is the way the cosmic density goes in the nearby region. If you add this cosmological constant, then when the density drops below that, of course the cosmological constant will kick in. So it will turn around. Now add to it this point where you have rho eq, you already have two densities here and I told you that during inflationary phase you had one more density. So I have now introduced you to the three most important numbers in the universe. There are three densities, one density of the universe when the universe was inflating very early on. There is one density which characterizes when the matter and radiation was dominating and another density which has just started dominating very recently and that is driving the accelerated expansion of the universe. So there are these three numbers which we want to understand. But if you look at it, of these three numbers, these two I told you high energy physics can tell you. We have absolutely no idea where it comes from and I want to introduce you where this problem is. So this is this cosmological constant. It can be equivalently thought of in terms of a quantity which uh, which has the dimensions of inverse length square. Okay, it can be measured in centimeter square per centimeter square. What you can do is to go and uh, introduce three more constants which we have talked about right at the beginning: the g, the h, and the c. So you are bringing together gravity quantum theory and relativity and you are bringing the cosmological constant also along with it. This object has dimensions of square of centimeter, square of the length. This object has the dimensions of 1 by length square. So the product is a pure number. It could have been 13.8. It could have been 25. So it is a pure number 
based on which our universe is built. Okay? It's a design parameter of our universe because the universe has G, it has H, it has T, it has lambda. So this number, you want to know what it is. Well, we, have, we know what it is. Number happens to be 10 to the power 123, minus 123. So for those of you who are not mathematically inclined, let me explain what this means. We normally talk in terms of small numbers as 1 by 10, 1 by 100, 1 by 1000, 1 by million. So it is all 1 by a number which is 1 followed by certain number of zeros. 1 by 100 is 1 followed by 2 zeros or 1 by 1000 is 1 followed by 3 zeros. So you write 1 and follow it with 123 zeros and 1 by that is what this number is. Now the theoretically we have absolutely no clue where it came from. At least this was the situation in last two years. So in the last part of the talk, I want to claim that we now have an understanding of this number. So this was the major problem in theoretical physics. You can write this number in very many different ways. For example, the inflation energy density to this energy density is something similar. So you can write down various numbers and these are all either very large or very small numbers. So the question is where it comes from. So I told you that this is a major problem in theoretical physics. People knew about it, lot of people worked on it and I am going to claim that we have the answer. So you may ask how, how come people missed it and uh, this explains why people missed it and in case you haven't read this book, you should go and read it, it is a delightful book. So the way people attacked this problem before us was that they thought yes there is this lambda and uh, we do not understand its value so let us attack it and let us figure out what its value is. I do not think that is the right way to go about it. The problem actually has to do with gravity. There are two questions about gravity which is lying behind it. The first thing I can ask in the form, why is gravity immune to energy shift? So let me try to illustrate what it is. I told you that there is a constant density here, which is plateau. Suppose I change it and I lower it or suppose I increase it. I can do, I can set that scale anywhere. I can do this by just changing what kind of matter I have in the universe because I can define the zero point level of the energy by rising it or lowering it. It is a known fact in physics that anything other than gravity does not care what you set is the zero level of the energy. Suppose you are, you have a hydrogen atom and you look at its energy level and you decide to add 30 years to all energy levels, nothing will change. Okay. But gravity cares about this absolute value, but observations tell you that gravity does not. So you have a contradiction as to explain how gravity is immune to this. And the related question is, okay, let us assume that somehow you make gravity immune to it, you still have to understand where that level is. Finally, in the universe that zero level is set at some number. And you need a theory which will explain for you that number, that very tiny number, 10 to the minus 120. So you need both of these. So this is the number which we need to attack. Now it turns out that in order to solve this problem, you need a completely new perspective. You need a paradigm shift in the way we have been looking at gravity itself. So what we came up over the last 10 years or so, is that what we thought of gravity could be all wrong and the gravity could be what physicists call an emergent phenomenon. So I want to describe to you first what I mean by an emergent phenomenon. In fact, all of you know what an emergent phenomenon is except that that term is not very, very usually used. So you take something like elasticity. So suppose I have a rod and you are an engineer and you are going to use this steel rod to build something, maybe a bridge maybe a beam in the concrete. You want to know all kinds of elastic properties of the rod, but you do not really care what atoms, what iron atoms are doing internally, you do not give a damn. All that you want to know is the Young's modulus and the stress and strain of that rod and then you can build your bridge or you can use it in a cantilever. So the elasticity is a theory which has a life of its own, independent of what the matter is made of. Same with fluid mechanics, suppose you are studying the gaseous properties, a chemist is studying gaseous properties. Many times if he is interested in a macroscopic gas laws, he is not really bothered what a microscopic atoms are doing. So these are examples of elastic uh, emergent phenomena 
and uh, at least uh, all the all the students probably even plus two level students will be familiar with an equation like this. This is called the ideal gas equation. It is related the pressure, volume, and temperature of an ideal gas. This was known before people understood what the gas is made of. What our studies suggest is that gravity and the equations of gravity is like this. The gravity describes the physics of some kind of atoms of space time. So just as if I have a fluid or a gas, I can write down a gas law and study the dynamics of the gas without knowing what the gas is really made of. Of course, if you know that, you can it enriches your understanding, but even without that, you can describe the gaseous behavior. In the same way, we can describe the behavior of the space-time without actually knowing what the atoms of space-time are. And that is, it is in this sense that gravity is an emergent phenomenon. So what we need to do is to study gravity exactly the way physicists studied gas dynamics before they knew what the atomic structure of matter was. You don't need that. And you can study gravity in an emergent perspective. Now, the main problem here is one of experiment. In the case of gas dynamics or molecular dynamics, when the theoretical ideas came along, experimental conformation was very cute because the sizes you are talking about is sort of, uh, you know, a few angstrom. So, in order to tell you what we are talking about and how tiny it is, I have given a graph here. In this axis, I have drawn the macro world, the entire universe. From you go from here, everyday scale, to something like 10 to the power 30, you are reaching the end of the universe. These are galaxies, clusters of galaxies, this is the microwave radiation. And here is where your planetary systems are. <coughs> now, suppose I go the same distance in steps of 10 into the microscopic world. Our known experimental physics stops here. This is the scale which we have explored. We don't know what it is after that. And if you believe theoreticians and indirect evidence, you can go up to this. This is the scale comparable to the edge of the universe. What I am going to talk about is here. Which means that I have to go further down in the microscopic physics, more than we have gone from here till the edge of the universe in the macro world. So it is an enormously tiny scale and that is where all these things are happening. So what this uh, paradigm tells you, which can be tested only in cosmology, is that the equations which describe gravity are like equations of gas dynamics. And more importantly, when you work out the mathematics of that, it emerges, two things emerge. The first is that gravity does not care about you are shifting the energy level up or down, which is important because I told you that in the conventional way of looking at gravity, you do not have that and that problem is solved completely. And you can also do some things like what chemists were doing. Chemists could measure something called Avogadro's number even before they knew what they were counting. They knew that there is some large number of something in this box, 10 to the power 24 or whatever, or one mole of gas at STP will have 22.4 liters. Okay? These numbers were known even before the atomic physics or the molecular physics of the gaseous content was there. And you can do the same thing for gravity and I can tell you how many atoms of space time are there. I do not know what they are. But I can tell you that if you take an area A and divide by something called the Planck length square, which is like 10 to the power 66. So one square centimeter of any area contains 10 to the power 66 atoms of space time. So I can tell you that, but I cannot tell you what these atoms are because we have not got there yet. And then using these atoms of space time, there is a very nice way of describing gravitational evolution. So this is some region in space. You just think of some region, normal space, ordinary three-dimensional space. This is the surface of that, it is like a surface of a potato or something. And on the surface, you have these atoms of space time and you count how many are there. Then you count how many normal degrees of freedom the atomic degrees of freedom are there in the bulk due to normal matter. It turns out that the region here will evolve in time, its curvature will change, its gravitational dynamics will change, etc. If this is not equal to this, if this n bulk by n surface differs from 1, the dynamical evolution of the system will be governed by this. 
you can actually prove this. And you can show that this is completely equivalent to Einstein's theory. So the Einstein theory essentially tells you that there is these atoms of space-time on the surface and in the bulk, and it is the difference between these two which is driving the evolution. This takes a very beautiful point of view regarding the evolution of the universe. It turns out, I told you that the universe has three phases. There is an accelerated phase here, there is an accelerated phase here. In between, there is a decelerated phase. There are three densities. It turns out that in this phase and in this phase, the number of atoms on a surface and the number of atoms in the bulk, the degrees of freedom is the technical term, they are the same. So it is in some kind of quasi equilibrium in these two regions. And in between, they are not the same, and that is what drives the expansion of the universe. It is a transient phase. It goes from this level to this level through this, and we are caught somewhere in between. Okay. So this is the picture of the universe which you get. And this picture of the universe involving these atoms of space-time in the bulk and in the surface allows you to solve the second most important mystery about the cosmology. I told you that there are these three numbers, out of which this and this can come from high energy phase. And we have no clue what this is. I explained to you that it is a very tiny number. It is like 10 to the pi minus 123. And people think it's a very important number to get, but they don't know how to do that. We now know how to do that. If you use this picture, you get a formula. So unfortunately, uh, I have to describe it using an equation, so I do that. So you get a formula. Those of you who are not mathematically minded only has to grasp the following. This is a mathematical expression which has no parameters. I mean, there is, I can't tinker with it. I mean, it's just an equation. It is like saying 3 plus 5 is equal to 8. Okay. On the left hand side is one of these densities. Remember there are three densities here. This is the unknown density. These are the two densities which people have hope of getting from high energy physics. And then rest of it is pure numbers. Those of you who are mathematically inclined will immediately recognize that this object which is called the exponential of minus 36 pi square can be enormously tiny. And it is that which is leading to a 10 to the minus 123. So you have a formula and you plug in the values, you get back exactly what you need, what you see in this time. So this relation comes from this theory. And it relates the three densities in the universe, which was otherwise thought of as three independent okay. So you can actually put bounds on this, etc., etc., but those are technical aspects. So this emergent gravity paradigm has the potential of solving probably the greatest theoretical puzzle which we face today. And this is the thing which we are working on right now. So let me just summarize. The first point is that, as I said, we do understand the evolution of the universe from a fraction of a second to about 14 billion years. And as I said, that is very satisfying and very nice and very good. And uh, if people want to do cosmology, most cosmologists will be working on filling in the details for this 14 billion years. There is a lot of details which you can work on. But as I told you, the really exciting part is to go beyond. Go beyond this uh, 1 billionth of a second and ask what happens. And there we have the picture that the vacuum fluctuations at this very fraction of a second during the inflationary phase acted as the seeds for the cosmic structures which we see today and it expanded and formed the kind of structures which we see today. We have experimental confirmation, somewhat indirect, for this. It along with it comes with a puzzle that if your entire picture has to be correct, then you also need something which I call the cosmological constant, which should contribute about 70 on percent or 70 percent of the energy density today. All of that has to come from this particular constant, is what I have called the emergent gravity paradigm. And you need a new paradigm to explain that. And that approach leads to the value of the cosmological constant, the numerical value that I gave you as a formula, and the why gravity does not care for adding or subtracting of constant energy density. So this is the, as I said, this is the way where things stand today. And we want to take this further and understand the very early moments of the universe by this approach. Thank you very much.
to the emergent gravity theory? No, not really. Because the way string theory would approach this problem is from bottom up. So the philosophy of string theory is, is that suppose we know what molecules of the gas is, then using that I can get you the gas loss. So that is the way they are approaching. My point of view is that we do not know what the molecules of gas is and it is a little premature to assume we do. Therefore, it is much better to go the other way around, the way the theoretical physicists did in 17th century or 18th century. Start with the known laws of gas and go down and see what the microscopic structures has to be. That has the advantage that it really doesn't matter what the final ultimate theory of quantum gravity is, whether it is string theory or loop quantum gravity or something else, I don't care because all of them have to lead to this, if they are right. If it doesn't lead to it, they are wrong because it is like having a molecular theory which does not lead to ideal gas equation. Okay. The disadvantage is that just knowing ideal gas equation, I am never going to be able to tell you what the molecules are made of. Okay. So in order to do that, we have some ideas, like we want to bridge the gap by going from both directions and approaching it. So I, I believe there are some good ingredients in string theory. There is a principle called holography, which is reflected in something which we have been approaching from the top down. But I think most of what string theory has been doing is excess baggage and it has to go away. Well, scientific controversies have a way of never getting resolved. It just goes away. My opinion is those results are, uh, I would treat it with extreme caution. Because when it came itself, I was suspicious for technical reasons, because they have observations only in one frequency, and they had no good way of subtracting. They are seeing something. The question is whether they are seeing the polarization due to some material in between, or whether it is actual cosmic micro. Yeah, yeah, but that is the frequency. But at that frequency, the polarization measurement could have been contributed by the foreground material. No good way of subtracting it. So that was the controversy all about. And it turned out that uh, by the time they published the paper, they have retracted most of their original time. The paper got published in Physical Review Letters. There in the abstract itself, they say that uh, it is possible that this, is not, this effect is not real. Not really, but we will know for sure in October because the competing team, which is the Planck team, which could not see this when they first analyzed it, is uh, rapidly looking into this. And they will, they have much better control on their measurements and they have measurements at different frequencies so that they can do a subtraction. So they will be able to, if they confirm this, then fine. If they don't confirm it, I would not uh, take this seriously. Sir? I have a doubt regarding that cosmological constant. Now, is this the same constant which Einstein himself had introduced into his equations in order for the universe to, to stop from expanding or is there any connection between the two? It's identical. Oh, identical. Okay, but the, that history is usually a bit distorted, so let me just explain that in a minute. So, uh, when Einstein actually wrote down these equations, he solved it and he found that the universe is expanding. Now, even Einstein hesitated at that time and he said that, oh no, universe can't be expanding and people will say, I am crazy, I am crazier than they were saying before. So, let me stop the universe from expanding. So, he added a constant and thought that with that, he can stop the universe from expanding. But it turned out that, very gratifyingly, Einstein made an algebraic mistake in his calculation. So, as a result of which, what he thought was a stable solution was unstable solution. And very soon other people, especially De Sitter, pointed out that even with this constant, universe can expand. So the purpose for which this constant was introduced was not served. And also he later on, there is a kind of a statement in the popular press that he called it his greatest blunder in his life. This comes from George Gamow's writing in his autobiography. And there are other things in George Gamow's writing in autobiography which are not uh, completely accurate. So we are not sure whether this quotation can be taken very seriously. Good afternoon, sir. You have been speaking about an accelerating universe all the time. Yes. Then uh, what about the Hubble constant which speaks about objects moving away at a constant velocity? Yes. The Hubble constant can tell you that objects are moving away with a constant velocity. What Hubble constant tells you is that if you put an object at a distance x, it will move with a velocity v. 
If you put it at a distance 2x, it will move with a velocity 2v. So the velocities are not constant in uh, Hubble constant. What it is telling you is the rate of expansion. Now what we are asking is the time derivative of the Hubble constant. That is the Hubble constant today is some value. Suppose I look at the Hubble constant at a earlier epoch and a Hubble constant at still earlier epoch. The rate at which the universe is expanding is that itself changing. Now think of a car which is going forward. It is always going forward. The universe is always expanding. But it can go forward with greater and greater speed. It can go forward with slowing down speed like a car trying to come to a halt. So the question is which of these two models are correct. What we now realize is that universe is in a hurry and it keeps going with greater and greater speed. So looking at your plot, the once it comes to the rho lambda, yes. the energy density is going to stay constant. Yes. So that means that the universe is going to keep expanding at an accelerated That's rate. That's correct. So is there anything that will lead to uh, further decay of the density or is it going to be stuck there forever? Yeah. Uh, the, if the current pictures are correct and uh, our interpretation of the cosmological constant is correct, it is going to be stuck there forever. And uh, it is going to be a pretty boring place to live some few tens of billions of years down the line. Okay. So it is, it is going to keep expanding with ever accelerating phase and things will just recede away. And there is nothing, because it is just a constant term in an equation, there is nothing which can dynamically affect this cosmological constant. So that is the end of the life of the universe will be. Well, uh, it turns out that the vacuum fluctuations which I talked about in the very early universe, which created all these things, happened in a phase of accelerated expansion. Now I am at a very late stage, I am again talking about an accelerated expansion. And there are vacuum fluctuations in this phase as well. These vacuum fluctuations are currently very tiny. It is tinier than what is contributed by the microwave background radiation. But at late stages, that is going to start dominating. So it won't be very cold. There will be a minimum temperature, which is decided by this cosmological constant. It will reach that temperature. That temperature is very tiny. but it is not zero. We can, we can see in all the formula the velocity of light C. And we use always the fundamental uh, starting, uh, we use Lorentzian transformation. I think the C comes from that. Uh, is it sufficient, this Lorentzian transformation? Especially the understanding the gravity is space time symmetry. So uh, we, uh, we everything C with, uh, since we are in the optical, uh, we use as always C. But C itself is, uh, I think, uh, uh, something is breaking down in the space-time symmetry. So why don't we think uh, whether uh, something fundamentally wrong uh, by using the Lorentzian transmission to develop this whole theory? Whether I think... No, no, I, it's my... It's my uh, maybe this question may be blunt up, but I feel, because when I teach, always there is doubt. Uh, so I say there will be a fundamental problem, because the C is everywhere, but the gravity is not contained in it. And we are dealing always with the, we are looking the everything with the C. And, but C is, uh, you know, uh, within the space-time symmetry, space-time geometry, continuum. Uh, I think we, uh, why don't we think beyond the Lorentzian transformation? Yeah. The, first of all, we do think beyond the Lorentz transformation in general theory of relativity. Because this, there are two kinds of relativity, the special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity. In special theory of relativity, you use C and the Lorentz transformation. In general theory of relativity, you don't use Lorentz transformation. It doesn't play any fundamental role. You use what is known as general coordinate transformation. These are much, much, much larger group by mathematical sense. So going beyond Lorentz transformation is something which people have already done. The next question is whether C is something fundamental or whether there is something more fundamental to C than that. The reason people don't think about this is because over the last 100 years or so, special theory of relativity is being verified routinely in the laboratory. I told you about this PET, positron emission uh, tomography techniques, which are used in hospitals. If you tinker with special relativity and change C slightly, or you make C time dependent, C makes, uh, make it phase dependent, or you tinker with uh, Lorentz transformation, that machine won't work. 
So there are so many things which are very tightly interwoven with this speed of light being constant that most physicists are not courageous enough to go and tinker with it because they have to rebuild the entire physics from scratch upwards and they see no reason for that. Well, actually, gravitational waves, you know, again, yeah. this, uh, we come to the article, uh, special theory of waves. No, uh, gravitational waves travel with the speed of light. Oh, 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 because it comes from the special theory. No, not because. Because gravitational theories are built in general theory of relativity. So general theory of relativity also has that. Neutrinos, if they were massless, they would have traveled with the speed of light. There is a lot of things which travel with speed of light, which has nothing to do with the light. Uh, sir, just as a matter of interest, Saying that yeah, the universe is expanding, like accelerating, as you said, under what theoretical conditions can we expect a big crunch? As big crunch. The big crunch. Okay. Under what conditions does it come with? Okay. So, one condition where it can come from is that the model which I gave you for cos... I mean, I first said that the dark energy is cosmological constant. Now, there are other people who believe it is probably not cosmological constant but something which looks very much like cosmological constant. So they will have to, as I told you, observations tell you that cosmological constants explain everything. And if you reverse the observations, you end up getting something which is constant. But in physics, you can say something is a constant, but somebody can say, yes, it is constant up to your measurement. There is a small twiddle in it. And there is no way you can uh, disprove that. So if you tinker with the cosmological constant idea and put some other model for dark energy, you can arrange things in such a way that today it is cosmological constant. At much later times, you can have anything you want. Okay? The problem with all these models are that they are not predictive. The moment I tell you cosmological constant, I have no further parameters in the theory. I can't tinker with anything. What the mathematics tells you is either right or wrong. And it seems to give you the right numbers. But the moment you change it, and you change it, and you start modeling it by other things, then you can do anything you want. There are models like that in which you can have big crunch. But if cosmological constant is what is accelerating the universe, then there is no big crunch. The gravitational, universal gravitational constant H and C all together, right. one by one, one by one. Right. But then uh, H, uh, G and H, those two together. Yeah. Very good question. I was wondering whether somebody will catch me on that. Well, it turns out that uh, that picture was taken from a paper which I have written some time back and co-authored with uh, Hamsa Patmanavan, who is my daughter. And you will find the reference in my web page, which is entirely devoted to this question which you are asking. What happens if you take H and G together? So here we are talking about quantum mechanical effect in Newtonian gravity. Like if I take a neutron, which is a quantum mechanical object, and I drop it, and when it is falling in Earth's gravity, how does it behave? How does quantum mechanics and Newtonian gravity talk to each other? There are some very interesting things which can be said there, and that is one vertex in the cube which is not sufficiently well explored. So this picture is taken from our paper, and in that our paper, we draw these vertices, and we exactly say this. We say that there is one vertex which no one has noticed, is a sort of forgotten vertex of the theoretical physics. And we then discuss what happens there. So you should go and read up that text. I have a basic question. Some, uh, the, the, the black hole in the universe, is major part of it is said to be constituted by dark matter. So, but then recently, the Stephen Hawking had said that uh, there's nothing called black hole. So is that true, or like, is that a hypothetical? Or, or we say that okay. I didn't quite get the first part of the question. Are you saying that the most of the dark matter is contributed by black holes or most of the black hole is contributed by dark matter? Yes, the second part is. Okay, no, that is probably not correct. I, I don't know where you got that line from, but uh, black holes are the end stages of stellar uh, collapse and the stars are made of normal baryonic matter. There is very little dark matter in the core of the sun. So if uh, a star like sun or more mossy star like sun eventually become a black hole, there will be very little dark matter in that uh, black hole. So the other statement has been made. So maybe somebody misquoted it. People have tried to understand whether part of the dark matter, which we talk about, which doesn't emit light, is made of black holes, primordial black holes, etc. Okay, but that is one part. 
Coming back to Stephen Hawking's statement, what he essentially said was that there is some properties of the black hole called even horizon, which tells you that there is a surface from which light can never come to you, and that surface has to get formed, and it takes some amount of time to form it. So he had some uh, ideas on how long it will take for this surface to get formed, etc. But uh, if uh, somebody other than Stephen Hawking has said it, nobody would have even taken note of it. And it is not such a major idea because this is something which was sort of known in the community for quite a long time, but he just gave a tweak to that. It does not have any direct bearing on dark matter studies or even for black hole studies. And particles faster than light at ECG, so that she might come up with a hypothesis. That doesn't exist, does it? No, it, that as a hypothesis, it is a very cute hypothesis because his argument was that you think of uh, speed of light as a barrier and every barrier has two sides. So if you can have particles on one side, why can't you have things like tachyons on the other side? But observationally, we have never seen an evidence for the existence of tachyons or the need for the tachyons. But theoretically, it is a very attractive concept. Thank you. Sir, uh, everything you said in the presentation was considered in the Big Bang Sir, uh, what about the steady structure? Uh, right now, what is the research going on in that area? Well, uh, as far as the conceptual understanding of the universe is concerned, there is extremely strong observational evidence to prove that steady state theory is wrong. So, it was a very attractive idea once upon a time in the early 60s because it has some very beautiful philosophical ideas underpinning that. But by 65, people have had doubts about it. By something like, uh, let us say, early 80s, it was very clear that that is not the right way to go. So even uh, people like Narlikar who were working in steady state theories modified it into something called quasi-steady state theory, which is more like Big Bang than like steady state theory. And now I don't think too many people are seriously pursuing it for very good reasons. I think that is observationally completely ruled out. Yeah, there is a hand going up there. So I saw an expression that connects three numbers in one of the previous slides. Right. Uh, we can, in, since uh, the both three numbers are caught in the same y-axis, they should have the same dimension. Yes. And considering they are the mere numbers, three yes. numbers can be matched in a multitude of ways. Then is there a sub theory that substantiates this expression that caught in this slide? Is the correct one that matches the three constants what we sought for? Yeah. So the point is that uh, the dimension correct, this is to the 3 by 2, this is to the half, so this will have the same dimension. So I don't see what you are talking about. All, all these three have the same dimension. Yeah, my question is whether these are uh, uh, triad and error related, like dimension analysis or there is a rigid uh, derivation behind this expression. Yeah. First of all, this expression has a very rigid, very rigorous derivation. That is, I am not going into that, but it has a very rigorous derivation. Okay. Because without that, you can't get number like uh, 4 by 27 here. Yeah. Dimensional analysis will never give you 4 by 27. Yeah. So that is not the point. Second, if if you use dimensional analysis, if you think about it, you will realize that when you have three objects with the same dimension, dimensional analysis completely fails. Because with two objects, I can produce something which is dimensionless. Then I can do anything I want with that dimensionless combination and write one in terms of the other. Do you understand what I am saying? Yes, I could have written this as, uh, instead of 3 by 2, I could have put 5 by 2 here, right? Yes, and I could have put something here just to cancel the 3 by 2 here and I could have got that. It could have been 5 by 2 and 3 by 2. It could have been 27 by 2 and something corresponding here to give you this. So dimensional analysis will never give you a relation like this. Before the 1 billionth of the second. Okay, we, uh, 1 billion of the second is like 100 GeV. So the some of the things which I told you about the vacuum fluctuations which are generating the seeds of the cosmic structures happened much, much, much before 1 billion of the second. So part of the story which I told you, in fact most of the story I told you in the later part happened, the inflation which I talked about happened much before 1 billion of the second. It happened at uh, something like 10 to the minus 33 seconds. Okay. So all these things we are now directly seeing. 
well, I would say indirectly seen in the cosmic microwave background radiation and the other thing. But we still have a bit more distance to go because we have got up to something like 10 to the minus 44 seconds, which is when the quantum gravitational effects are important. And until we have a model for quantum gravity, we cannot go beyond that. Uh, fluctuations. Yes. Sir, when we are saying this, uh, we are talking about Big Bang. And that is the point when we are actually, the time has started. Uh, measuring the time has started. That is why we are talking billionth of a second and like that. So, sir, uh, how can we say about vacuum fluctuations in that tiny uh, billionth of a time? Yeah. Okay. So, the point is that it happened in the universe within, let us say, first 20 minutes. And then from one minute to something like 300,000 years, nothing happened. It was a boring place. And 300,000 years to another 14 billion years, again, nothing happened. Nearly around 10 billion years, various things started happening. So things don't go uniformly in the universe. And when you go to, as Roshan was asking, if you go to time scales before one billionth of a second, lots of events take place. Okay? And we have no way of perceiving it because we say everything below one billionth of a second is some tiny thing. But you should think in terms of powers of time. So if you do that, then you can go up to this number which I told you, which is one part in 10 to the 44 seconds. That is an absolute bound because that is the time below which you cannot proceed without knowing the full theory of quantum gravity, which we don't have. So until that time, if you take that particular point as the starting point and then you count, you will still get 14 billion years because you are subtracting a tiny fraction from that 14 billion years or 300,000 times or even 10 minutes or whatever. So when you say that you are starting time at the Big Bang, you are not being very precise. You are starting time from the edge of our knowledge and the edge of our knowledge today is blocked by our inability to put quantum theory and gravity together.